All right. Just setting up everything up there. All right. How y'all doing? Last few months have been very interesting for me. And um, going in, uh, going into new areas of the scripture that <coughs> I've looked at in times past, but didn't spend a lot of time there. And so the Lord's kind of taking me into this, and it's because, <coughs> as I talked, I've talked about before, is the the fact that the church is financially in trouble. Christians um, are having problems financially, and we're not supposed to. The reality is, Christians are supposed to be the light of the world. And how can you be that when the world looks at us and goes, there's no difference between us and them. They're hurting just as much as we are. But if we had a solution to their problems, and I think that's what religion or church is about is supposed to be about. I believe that that's what it's about. It is about in our relationship with God. And so tonight, talk, and I'm hoping that the teenagers and the young people will listen, uh, because this is something that I hope they can grasp onto while they're young. And I, I'm going to do a conference in a few months. I'm already, I've already started working on it. And it grew, and it's up to about six hours, I think, right now. And I think it's going to go to a two-day conference. And uh, what part of it is going to be at, I would t- be about, is I would title it, Why Do Jews Make More Money Than Christians? Why do Jews make more money than Christians? If we are all about faith and we believe that just trusting in God is all sufficient, we should be very wealthy. I mean, the Bible tells us that. I mean, if you look in the scriptures, we should be doing very well. But I mentioned, I think, a few weeks ago, but I had read a book, and it was uh, actually it's done by a woman. Uh, her name is Lisa Keister, and she's a professor of sociology at Ohio State. And she did a study on wealth in America. She actually did a book, and it's called Tr- Wealth in America, Trends in Wealth in Inequality. And as she began to do the research, what she found was is that Jews as an average, have an average net worth of $151,000. That means at the end of the day, if you sold your house, got rid of all your bills, took all, everything you had in savings and equity, this is how much money they would have. Mainstream, mainline religions such as Catholics, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Lutheran, what they call mainstream, they were the next group and they were at $48,000. Faith-based Christians, I'm talking about the Christians that watch Kenneth Copeland, the Pentecostals, the Charismatics. The faith-based Christians have an average net worth of $26,000. That's nearly six times less than the Jews. So where, what is it, where does that come from? What is, what's causing that situation? And, and I, as I've mentioned before, and one of the things that really hit me as I began to look at the Hebraic situation and or what, the, what the Bible teaches, I recognized that the bankruptcy rate, the divorce rate, premarital birth, sickness, and disease is exactly the same in the body of Christ as it is in the world. Is that supposed to be that way? No, not at all. It shouldn't. So something's missing. There is a component in our theology that has to be wrong. Something else that this lady said, it was very, very informative. I, I bought the book. It's a real hard read, but it was very interesting. And this is what she said. She said, there is solid evidence to confirm that being raised Jewish and practicing Judaism leads to the accumulation of wealth. Now, if you were to say that to a Christian pastor in the body of Christ today, that this is what she's found as she began to do those searches, they would want to argue with that. They would want to say, oh, no, no, Christians are better off than the Jews. We have a better promise. We have a better covenant. And it's based upon a theology that we've adopted. Reality came out of Catholicism. We abandoned that 
front of the book out of fear of legalism. We were afraid that we would get caught up in legalism and that would displease God. And the reality is the law won't save us, correct? It can't save us. We are saved by the grace of God. But what has happened is we have done something that has hurt us and it's something that has basically affected our children. We have created a mindset among the Gentile that has guaranteed our children are going to struggle when they become adults. The average person, the average Christian today, if you go into a household, the wife generally has to work. And they live from paycheck to paycheck. That is the norm in America among Christians and the heathen. It doesn't matter. The reason is, is because we bought into things that we were told that were passed on down line from our fathers and our grandfathers that we inherited and nobody challenged them. And because we didn't have somebody saying, no, you need to go a different route, we all went down that same path. And that was basically get a job, work hard, save your money. Correct? That's what I was told as a kid. My dad, my dad said, get, you, get a job, get a good job. My father-in-law told me, get a good job. I don't know why they needed to tell me that. But you know what's interesting is my father, who worked at a steel mill for 23 years, that steel mill closed. He went to work for another steel mill, and that one closed. And it turned out when it was said and done, he was struggling. He now lives on, he lost his pension. The company basically lost his pension, and he lives on Social Security now. He and his wife struggle. My father-in-law worked for a company for 20-some-odd years. They closed. So my point is this, there is no such thing as security working for somebody else, is, is what I'm trying to get across here, and, and I hope you understand this. A Yale University pro professor, a guy named David Gerlinter, said this, Judaism is the most important intellectual development in human development. I found some statistics that I thought was very interesting that the Jewish, po the Jewish people make up only 1% of the world's population, but they are 25% of the billionaires in the world. You think maybe they know something that we Christians, Gentiles, weren't taught? Is it possible that we miss something, that our fathers in the Reformation are coming out after the apostles that died in, in, back in, in, in uh, 60 AD and around that time? Is there something that just went wrong? And what's interesting I see today is Gentiles go to, go to college to get a good job. Jews go to college to enter high-paying high professional jobs. They, they become, and I should, they shouldn't call them jobs because a doctor, he's not an employee. A lawyer is not an employee. When he, he's out there, he's making a lot of money. The other reason that Jews go to college is to learn how to run businesses. I was thinking about this, uh, I was talking to Dan this week, and he said that, I believe he said Carrie was going to go to cosmetology school or something. Gentiles, we learn to do that type of stuff so we have a good job. A Jew would go, all right, I'm going to go to cosmetology college, I'm going to go through that, I'm going to learn how to cut hair, I'm going to learn how to do all of those things so I can start my own business. That's the difference. We settle in to something that, is not truly beneficial. We've, we've bought into a concept that is not really a blessing. Jews go to school to learn accounting for their business. Gentiles go to school and learn accounting so they can be an accountant for another business. And the problem with this is just having a job. And, 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 and I have to explain this. There's nothing wrong in having a job. I want you to understand that. But you can't depend solely on that is what I believe we see in Scripture. And what I mean, like, we have several people in here who have jobs, but if you look at the biblical principles, I'm going to go through just a few in a little bit, but the biblical principles say invest your money. And this is one of the things that I, I, have, I know is true. Have you ever seen these people? Uh, there was a show that they show uh, all these people who've won uh, big Powerball jackpots, you know, $200 million, 
and in five years they're broke? They can't figure out what happened? It's an interesting thing. This is a reality. If Donald Trump, and I've heard this, and you've probably heard this before, but if Donald Trump was to become broke tomorrow, in five years he would still be a multimillionaire. The average American, however, if you give him $200 million today, in five years he'll be flat broke. Why is that? It's because of a mindset that we have, especially among our poor. Our poorer people, if they get a windfall of an extra $200 in a week, what do they do with the $200? They go party. They go buy something. One of the things I heard this, this wealthy man say, he was talking about the difference between rich people and poor people is, rich people have big libraries. They spend money on books everything they can to learn, to, to, to get knowledge and wisdom about business. Poor people have big TVs and small libraries. Rich people have big libraries and small TVs. And what he was basically showing is the mentality that we get raised in that's been passed on from generation to generation. When America was forming the immigrants that came here, if you read about them, it's really interesting. What would happen is the Irish, the Italians, the Scots, the Britons, they would come here and they would immediately start looking for a job. The Jews came here and immediately started figuring out how to open a business. I mean, if you go back and just read the story of Levi Strauss, and this is one of the things that I believe that we need to teach our children is they need to be more entrepreneurial. When I grew up, some of us will remember this, and it's still around, I just haven't heard about it. But in schools, they have a program called Junior Achievement. Junior Achievement was designed to help young people learn free enterprise. How to start your own business, how to do sales, how to market, how to do those types of things. And so I, never was, I was never encouraged to do those types of things. Matter of fact, when I went into my school counselor, he never talked to me about going to college. It may have to do something about my grade point average. I figured he, he just figured there's no way this guy's going to ever make college. And, the, and, and it may have been true, but I, I remember back then watching my father go to work in a steel mill and come home with, and I've told, talked about this, where he would have these holes in his hand where pieces of molten metal would fall and because of what he was doing he couldn't stop and get that off and so he had burn marks all over his legs you could see where it burnt through his work clothes into his skin and he did that every day to put food on the table and so when I got out of high school in Granite City there's Granite City Steel there was General Steel American Steel as you it was a steel town and my first concept, everybody I knew that wasn't going to college was going to Granite City Steel to get a job. So I went down there, filled out the paperwork, did my, all my, they did do these tests, and see how, if you can put a nut on a screw, actually. And I, I was really, I was pretty fast at it, so I, I got the job. But anyway, I remember the day I showed up, I went and bought my steel-toed shoes, and I went in, and I had got my hat, and there I was standing in line for the punch card thing. And I looked, and I realized, I don't want to do this. This is not what I want to be. I don't want to, I love my dad, but I don't want to do what my dad did. I don't want to be at a job like this, stuck, because I remember, and many of you know what I'm talking about, where you work for a company, it gets slow. What do they do? They lay you off. You go on unemployment. Now, back then, we didn't have food stamps. We had commodities. That's where you went down to a place, and they would give you a big box. And I've talked about this. They would get you this big box of best peanut butter, best cheese in the world. I don't know why they can't make that good stuff anymore, but it was really good stuff. But we went and got our weekly batch of groceries, and we would go home. And I remember that, and I, and I thought, I don't want to live like that. And so I, I kind of developed that entrepreneurial spirit. The problem was, as I look back, is nobody had trained me for that. And that's why I just, I kept making mistakes because I never studied, and I think if we take the Bible, 
the Old Testament and look at it, we learn principles about operating businesses. And that's what happens in Jewish communities. In the Jewish community, this, I just recently heard about this, that back in the day, 2,000 years ago, when they started a synagogue, they'd never built a synagogue until there were at least 10 businessmen to come into that synagogue. The reason was all their children were taught how to operate businesses. And so as we begin to think about those things, we need to understand that God never intended for us, as I look at the Jews, to be necessarily just an employee. I'm just saying that if you are an employee, you've got to do something else to make sure you have a secure future. One of the things in the scriptures, the Bible says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren. That means you've got enough money to leave for your children and your grandchildren. Well, we're not taught that that much. And I'm talking about in church. You don't hear anybody talking about that. What you hear about money is you need to pay your tithes and give your offerings. You know? That's what we're taught. We're not taught about how this benefits us. We're not taught, basically, how to sustain ourselves in life. It's basically go out and get a job. Go work for somebody else. And the thing is, what you do for that is, I, 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 I like this, uh, there's a show called Billionaire, or Millionaire, Blue Collar Millionaire. Anybody watch that? Oh, you got to watch it. It's a good show. They bring this guy out named Mark Stoner, and uh, he went to work for a chimney sweep company, making $50 an hour. And the reason he did that, he wanted to learn how to do that business. So he went, for learned, he, spent, he made $50 an hour. And here's the problem about just the job. You can't do any better than that. You exchange 40 hours, let's say for $50, that's it. Unless they give you some overtime, right? So you're stuck. But a business is different. See, a job won't work for you, but a business will. And what I mean by that is, Alan's sitting here. He has this business. He's built this really good water purifier. I don't know that anybody out there has got anything better. And this is a key to success. Some people say, well, I don't know what to do. Find something somebody else has done and just simply make it better. And that's what he's done. So now he's sitting in here, but he has a website. And he's got distributors. They're out there selling for him. That's what happens when a business is working for you, right? I, I know you older people aren't stupid, and I, I don't mean to be, I don't want to sound like I'm condescending to you, but I'm talking, as I said, I want the teenagers to understand this. When you have a business and you get it set up, people are working for you. They're making you money, right? That's the advantage. So a job is something that we have been taught just to go do, and what we should do is, if you're going to take a job, if you're going to go into construction, you go in with the idea, I'm going to learn how to do this so I can build my own house. You, you understand what I'm saying? If I'm going to go do, learn to do something, I'm going to go work for somebody, I'm going to learn what they do, how to do it, get all the information and knowledge I can so I can start my own business. Because the advantage is, and I'm just, I mean, there's a lot of work. I mean, a lot of aggravation and pain. One scripture says, where there are no oxen, the crib is clean, but by the power of the ox is great wealth. What that means is, if you don't have any oxen, well, you can't plow the field, you can't make any money, but if you have oxen, you've got a lot of poop you've got to shovel, okay? And that's what it is in business. That's the clean version. So basically what you have there is, you have a concept, that you're going to have to do some things you don't want to do. But that's part of business. The advantage is, Alan... If he decides he wants to take off and go fishing, if he wants to do that, he can do that. That's the advantage of, advantages of owning a business rather than working a job. Because if you go to the Europe boss and say, you know, I want to go fishing Friday, is it okay? He's going, well, we got all this work to do. No, you can't take off. Or some people call in sick and go fishing. Well, that's not a good thing at all, you know. So my, my point there is we need to start changing our mindset just simply the way that we think. One of the stories that I read just recently is about a woman named uh, Sarah Blakely. I had never heard of this stuff, but have you, who know, you women may know about the Spanx. Guys, we, have no, we may not know what that is. You may not know what that is. It's not a website, so don't, you know. When I heard about it, I didn't even want to go check, look it out. I had to find out really what was going on here. But what it was is this woman 
Um, it was summertime, apparently, and she had pantyhose, I'm sorry. And so she cut the legs off because she wanted her legs to be cool, but she wanted the form-fitting thing that pantyhose provides. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, <laughs> all right. Okay, you got the picture. So anyway, she decided this is a good concept, and what she did is she created the same thing. All it is is a modern girdle, okay? That's really what it is. It's just nicer, and she's created it to look better. I'm just going gonna, gonna to leave it at that. Well, anyway, so, so, yeah, I did go to the website. All right. But my point is, the, she, she came up with this idea, and one of the things that really hit me, because it goes with one of the principles we have in Scripture, which I'm going to read in a minute, but basically she was selling fax machines, and she decided, I don't want to do this. She was going business to business to business. She was making pretty good money. She was a hard worker. She goes, I don't want to do this anymore. So she got this idea, she made a prototype, took it to a company, and they said, no, we're not interested. Took it to another company, they said, no. Took it to another, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another. Finally, she found a company, and they said, yes, she made it. She is now a billionaire. A billionaire. I didn't say a millionaire, a billionaire. Just because she took an idea that somebody else had and made it better. See what I'm talking about? Just like what Alan did with this water purifier system. That's the kind of mentality that a Jew has. So my point is, we need to become more Jewish-minded. I'll put it that way. We really need to begin to start thinking, teaching our children to start thinking differently. Because as I've watched my sons, Jason has developed that entrepreneurial spirit, and he's... He's developing a business, he's, he's building it, and he's doing well. But he's learning skills that I never taught him. He's had to do it on his own, because I was never taught those things. Some of the things he's learned on his own, go and find, do, do what other people are doing and find it a, a better way, and that's what he did. So he goes to these estate sales, and he looks for things nobody else is looking for. Everybody else is going for the antiques and the, the Tiffany lamps and, and different things like that, and he's going after the things nobody else sees like an old dirty rug that looks like it needs to be thrown in the trash, then he gets it for 30 bucks, I think it is. Turns out it's a very, very uh, expensive rug, and if he had gotten it fixed, had it rewove, he would have paid 2000 for that, but would have been able to sell it for $8,000. Instead, just the guy says, well, I'll give you, I think, 800 bucks for it. Just turn it 80, uh, $30 to 800 just that quick. So. Just that mindset, he's going, I go after this totally different than everybody else, and he's getting stuff everybody else, and he's getting cool stuff. One of the things I found interesting is Mark Cuban went to Junior Achievement. It's where he learned the concept of free enterprise. A lot of people, my understanding is there's been one million people that have gone through that program since 1919. We don't have anything like that. And that's, but in Jewish families, it's already there. It exists in the Jewish family and in the Jewish synagogue. So my point is, as we begin to look at this, is we've got to quit thinking the way that we normally think. <clears throat> and I think, that, I think we have a, a good group of people that are that way. I mean, we've got people who have invested in real estate. That's excellent. That's what Scripture talks about that. Remember, not specifically about real estate, but remember when the Lord gives people, he gives one, one talent, one five and one ten? Well, the ten comes back with ten more, the five comes back. Well, the one comes back and says, well, Lord, I, I, you're, a, you know, you're a hard man, and I, I was afraid to do anything with it, and I kept it. And the Lord says, why didn't you at least invest it? Take it down to the bank and at least get some interest on it. So that's kind of what the scripture teaches, and what Jews take out of the law is basically, if I get extra money, how can I take that money and make it into more money? I watched a guy this week on, uh, again, the same show. He came here from Israel, mentality of, about, of a Jewish man. Comes here with $400 in his pocket, he is 19 years old, and what he did is he started going around finding things and selling it and building up his reserve. Then... He went and found, he started buying perfume wholesale and selling it to different people and started building more money. 
But here's an interesting thing that I found out of being, about being an entrepreneur is it attracts business from other entrepreneurs. So what happened is this guy knew who had met him called him up one day and says, you know what, I got a warehouse full of wood flooring that I can't get rid of. I need to liquidate. He said, if you can come and get it and put it somewhere and sell it, you can, I'll give it to you like 20 cents on the dollar or 10 cents. So he went and did that, and then he went and started selling that, and he became the flooring king of, I think, Florida. He's worth millions and millions of dollars. All he does is he goes and buys flooring that stores can't sell. He turns around and sells it to the public because he sells it cheaper, and he basically has, a, has developed this new concept. Then he got into the construction business, and the guy's a multimillionaire. So the concept of just believing in God, God will provide, I think is a lazy concept for us when we understand that God wants us to do something. And to me, when I think about this, that it's faith, be, faith alone, I think, is very similar to being lazy. Because to be successful, you'll find out it takes work. It's a lot of work. God's just not going to do something for you and just, hey, here, here it is. In Proverbs uh, 18 and 9, it says, He also that is slothful in his... Oh, let me go back. I missed the scripture. There is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spendeth it up. This is where I was talking about the Jews. When they get money, they, they invest it. Gentiles, poor Gentiles, they spend it. They get extra money, they have a party. Or they go buy something with it. So I want to go through some different scriptures here with you. He also that is slothful in his work is a brother to him that is a great waster. It's Proverbs 18 and 9. He's basically saying if you're not taking care of business, in just your home and things, that you're going to cause a lot of waste just by not taking care of things. The way of the slothful man is a hedge of thorns. But the way of the righteous is made plain. Now, I want, you to, I want you to understand something. When Solomon wrote these things, where did he get this knowledge for Proverbs? Because Proverbs is filled with dynamite information about business. I mean, just, just verse after verse after verse. It's how you should run a business. It's just how you treat people, that type of thing. Solomon got the information from the law. What he did is he took it and put it into an easier way to understand. So if you look in the law and it talks about being lazy, here he's talking about it. He makes it more palatable, more easy to understand. So when he says, when he talks about the way of a slothful man having, being the way of hedges, he's saying it's difficult for a, a lazy man. But then he says the opposite is a righteous man. So what does that tell us about a slothful man? If a hardworking man is righteous, what is a lazy man? Unrighteous. That's the correlation there. That's what God thinks of a lazy person who doesn't want to do anything. In Deuteronomy 29 and 9, the Lord spoke to Israel. And he said, Keep therefore the words of this covenant, do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. Now here's the interesting thing. If you look at the Jewish community, Jew, practicing Jews that practice Judaism are wealthier than the Jews that don't. But even the ones that don't practice Judaism are more wealthy than the Christian. Why? Because they were taught the principles, they're just not keeping the faith. They're still obeying the, the covenants that God said, if you'll do this, this is what will happen. They're still doing them because God said in order. It's like this, he says, gravity. I've established gravity. If you jump off the house, you're going to fall, okay? It, it's, it's a principle, it's in play. Same thing with making money. He said, if you do these things, this is what's going to happen, whether you have faith or not. So you may not have faith, and you may not go to heaven, but the principles, if you follow his covenant and his principles that he's established for his people, you can still prosper. That's why you have some evil people like George Soros, who is a Jew, who is very, what is he, Billions and billions of dollars. He's a horrible man. He's a terrible man. But he knows principles for creating wealth, and they came out of Torah.
one of the things that I found interesting is if you look at all the religious books, the Quran, the Tibetan Book of Life, the book for the Hindu, uh, for Indians, Hindu, or, or the Oriental, Oriental religion, the uh, Mormon Bible, and you compare it to the Bible that God created, the Old Testament, out of all of them, there is only one book that teaches prosperity and life. Only one. The others have good stories, interesting anecdotes and things, but there's only one, and that's God's Word. God's Word is the only, only book that is the wisdom for life. Totally. I think that's awesome. I think it's because He loves us. And He gave us this information, but again, what happened is we followed fathers that had abandoned the front of the book. So God's done away with that. We're not going to look at it. And what happened is we threw away all of these good principles for having a good life. Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 and 3 is, I think, an excellent biblical principle for business. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The first part is, this is one of the things I, I saw T.D. Jakes talk about this scripture. And I'm thinking, you know, he's going to have to talk about the law if he's going to talk about prosperity. Well, he didn't. What he said is, you need to stay away from scorners and God will bless you. The truth is, what is a scorner? Scorner is the person who tell you, you're never going to succeed. You're not ever going to fail. Did I tell you how many times Sarah Blakely went to CEOs to get her, her stuff manufactured? I didn't tell you that many. Take a guess. How many? I mean, think about it yourself. You got, this, you got this new project, and you take it to a company, and they say no. At what point do you go, you know what? This, nobody's going to be interested in this. What would be a reasonable number? You go, apparently nobody's going to be interested. Just throw out anybody. Three or four? A dozen, 12. Do you know how many she went to? 700. The set, right after the 700th, she got, a com she got a company that agreed. What does that tell you about the Bible talks about diligence? Now, somebody else would be telling her, this is where a scorner comes in. Sarah, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your time? Go back and sell fax machines. That's a scorner. A scorner or unwise counsel is somebody that is not giving you good wisdom. If you spend your time with, I'm talking to the young people, if you spend time with people that all they want to do is drink, play video games and things like that, they're never going to benefit you in any way. Do you know what wealthy people do? They never hang around with lazy people. They don't hang around with people that are constantly looking for the negative in anything. It's one of the, one of the six things that I heard this guy teach that rich people do. Number one, it's who they surround themselves with. You don't surround yourself with poor people. You don't take advice. None of us would take diet advice from somebody that weighed 600 pounds, right? Would we take financial advice from somebody who's struggling week to week and broke? Would we? Of course not. So it's the same thing here. It's, it, he's saying, surround people who are going to encourage you. In business, they call these things millionaire mindsets. And I'll tell you what, in some places, it's very hard to get into these groups. Because these are people that are intent on being, being or are already millionaires, and their, intent, their, their goal is to increase their wealth. And so when they come together, they're looking for people who are increasing knowledge, who are studying, learning things. And so they begin to share Maybe sometimes what they'll do is they'll have a guy that says, well, I've got, in my business here, I've got a problem. Anybody got a solution? And so they'll sit there and they'll start talking. And it's the way that they all build their businesses. And so one of the things that was really interesting as I began to look around, there's a lot of these out there. And guess who are in these? These are people that are making $100 million a year. They're still in those groups. Why? Because they understand the importance of knowledge and getting more wisdom, and getting more understanding. 
So you want to basically surround yourself with people who are encouraging you. If you say, I'm thinking about starting a business, don't do it with your dad who says, get a job. Remember that song, get, remember that song back in the 50s, get a job? Some of you might remember that. No? Come on, Susan, you remember that. Get a, you probably can sing it, Mike. Huh? Get a job, bump, bump, get a job. All right, I'm sorry. I, I regress there. One of the things, uh, I, I just want to just kind of quickly go through some principles that are in Scripture. Knowing what's going on in your business. Don't start it and not know everything that's going on. You have to be diligent. The Bi Proverbs 12 and 24 says, The hand of the diligent will rule, but the slack hand will be forced, will be put to forced labor. In other words, if you're not diligent about your business, you're going to end up working in a job. And what he's talking about in this other scripture, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. Now what he's talking about, remember Israel was an agricultural type community, right? They raised cotton, they raised wheat, uh, barley, they had cattle. Now one of the scriptures in here talks about the cattle and kine. And cattle represented oxen, um, horses, and cows, and kine was basically cows. So a person, filler on the roof, take it for, for instance. Most of us in here have seen that. Great movie. Uh, the guy there has a milk cow, and what he, that's, how he makes, that's how he feeds his family. So what he does is he gets the milk, he puts it in his jug, puts it in a, in a cart at the end of the day. He makes his, you know, they've made butter from the day before, and he goes out and he sells milk and butter to people, and that's how he made his living. What's well, the same thing back then? So then some would raise cattle for beef. They raise, they would they'd go out and they would then grow wheat and barley and that, and they would then use what they needed and they would sell that to other uh, countries that were nearby. So he's saying here, know the state of your herds, know what's going on, because if one of them has a disease that's communicable, that can be spread, you need to know that. I, rem I just remember being out at the Turnbow Farm when, when I was a young man going hunting and different things, and I remember Glenn being out there checking a cow or something, and, and they thought there was something wrong with it, and he was making sure, and he had it in a, in a separate pen there as, you, as we walked up to the house. It was really close by. And so what he had done is he had quarantined that from the rest. And so that's one of the things that you do. You have to know what's going on. And you, with, with everything that's going on, you have to know in your business whether somebody is embezzling money from you or is somebody stealing from you. So these are the types of things, the, the principles. Um, trust in the Lord, Proverbs 21 and 31. The horse is prepared for the battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. No matter what you do, you still have to trust God. Every day we thank God for what the Lord has done and blessed us with our businesses. And I recognize it's God that gives us the power to create wealth. I say that all the time. I know that. It is God that gives us the power to create wealth. Not to get by, not to struggle and just barely, you know, well, I'm going to pay this one, this bill this week, but I've got to wait next week to get the other one bill. That's not an abundance. That's not wealth. Wealth is when you've got more than enough, and at the end of the month you go, somebody you know needs some money or needs some help, and you're able to go do that. That's what God wants for us. That's what God wants for the young people to, to, to enjoy. Not to go out and, because I'll tell you what, this is an interesting number that came out not long ago. The average person that make, family that makes $70,000 a year is struggling. When I was young, that was a lot of money. If you were making $70,000, you were making a lot of money. Today, that's not a lot of money. There's a lot of couples out there making $100,000 that are still struggling because of the way that our economy is. And, of course, we're taught, go buy a, a bigger house, you know, buy nice cars. Rich people, one of the things that I found is a lot of rich people never buy a brand new car. They buy used vehicles because they save money. These are things that we don't get taught. Do whatever you have to do to get knowledge. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Wealth comes from knowledge and understanding what to do and how to do it. I went to, uh, 
one of the things that we do for our business is videos. And I went to a seminar in, uh, me and Jeremy did back several, a few years ago in California, and we paid $2,000 to attend a two-day seminar on how to produce videos to market your business. It was great information. The only problem was 90% of it while, the, while we were there was all about life coaching. It was done by a woman, and she had a lot of women there. And apparently these are women who are thinking about getting into business, and so she was having to get them all coached. Me and Jeremy are wanting the mechanics, you know what I'm saying? We, we want to know how do you start, you know, what's the best shot? How, what camera do you use? Those types of things. But it was well worth it. Still learned a lot of, there was some good information in the coaching aspect too. But I spent money to learn, to gain knowledge. When Linda and I came back from Farmington, our finances were in really bad shape. It was 1982, and we were, had come back, moved in with Ed and Sue. And I wanted my own house. I didn't want to live in an apartment. We'd been married 10 years, and I'd been praying, God help us, and had gotten a, a good job at Amco. And there was a, a seminar that Kate was being advertised on TV about how to buy a house with no money down. Well, that's great. So I took $500. My father-in-law heard about that, <clears throat> and I got a good lecture about spending $500 on this stuff. But I did it. And I went there, and I took the course, got all the materials. I came back. And we'd heard about the house on uh, Oak Tree Drive. And the guy had had 17, 18 people living in it. They destroyed the house. So I went there, and I said, look, I don't have credit. I can't buy the house, but I'll make you a deal if you'll let me. I, I followed the, the formula that I paid $500 for. Followed that formula, and I had my contract. And I said, if you'll let me lease the house for a year, let me put 20% of what I lease it for as a down payment. At the end of the year, I'll be able to buy the house. He first said no. He went and looked at the house, saw how damaged it was. He come back the next day. He said, yeah, it's a deal. And uh, I said, well, I'll start fixing the holes. And so we bought a distressed property. That was 30 years ago. It's still a bit distressed. <laughs> We're still working on it, but we've done a lot to it. But my point is, I paid $500 to learn that knowledge. And I guarantee that was the best investment I ever made. So one of the things that I've learned is, Buy knowledge if you have to. If you have to go to seminar, go to school, go to college, it's okay. Just make sure what you're doing is actually going to benefit you. Because 85% of the people that go to college never use their degree in their job when they got out. Isn't that incredible? Both of my sons are still, after 20 years, are still playing, paying on their student loans. Now, see, that shouldn't have happened. What should have happened is I should have learned about investments and how to make money and not work a job. And, and even though, you know, I did, I'd work jobs and I was always trying, most of you know, I was always trying a business. I've had about nine or 10, you know. Some were successful, some weren't. That's another story. But point is, when my sons got ready to go to college, there should have been enough money there to help them. There should have been enough money for them to, in, for them to take and put a down payment on a house. But I, had, I, I didn't know how to prepare. I wasn't taught. I didn't have, my father never sat down to me and said, son, what you need to do is you need to take 10% of your money and put it away or do this and invest it. I didn't have that. We didn't have that Jewish father mindset to educate, educate us. So as I begin to see these things, I begin to realize we need... I'm not going to go through all these principles. But there's so many different things about pursuing excellence, about fearing God about honesty, about having false hope. The Bible is filled with all these different principles of a how. And I believe, this is one of the things that I think God has impressed upon me, is to teach people who are working how to create a micro-business. Don't go out and borrow $100,000 on your house to invest in a business. Start out something small. I watched this show, just to give you an idea. I watched this uh, show called uh, The Prophet, and it's a guy that goes into businesses that are struggling and he invests and he helps make the business a success because a lot of times these people have not had the education that he has had which is I don't know if he's Jewish or not but he knows basically business principles and so he can bring that business in to make it successful. She went into this business in uh, Indiana it was run by two women and we were selling marshmallows on the internet and they started in their home on the kitchen table they had a very successful business. And uh, the 
problem is, is they were really jerks. And it was on TV. And because of this one lady, she was horrible, horrible lady. Their business, because of the exposure they got on TV, they went out of, they've gone out of business. But I'm thinking marshmallows, making marshmallows. How in the world could that, how could you make money doing that? So I went and did some research. And for a batch of gourmet marshmallows, gourmet means simply it wasn't made in a factory, all right? Make it in your kitchen and it becomes gourmet. But anyway, my, my, the thing, what was interesting was for four ounces of marshmallows, it was four inches by four inches, an inch each square, and by about an inch and a half, that was eight bucks. And they're doing very, very well. And so I'm thinking, I told Linda, I said, maybe we ought to get into the marshmallow business, you know, in the evening, part time. So <laughs> uh, I will tell you this, if you have a weight problem, this is not a good business. Um, we made two batches, and I don't want to think. <laughs> what, I will have to tell you this. It was easy to do. I made this big batch in less than an hour, cost two bucks. I had $60 worth of marshmallows sitting there. Ate up all our profits. They were kosher. That was the key. And this is one of the things. Because I was talking to some, some, some Hebrew people, and I said, do you eat marshmallows? They go, no, you can't find any that are, there's no kosher marshmallows. And I said, let's see if we can do this. So it was a, it was a test is what it was. My point is this, is if, you're gonna, if, if you just open your eyes, I, it hit me, Bill's peanut brittle. How many of you have ever tasted that? That's some good brittle, all right? It's found out it was Sheila's recipe, I think. Bill was stealing the glory. <laughs> it was Sheila's brittle, but we, they, they called it Bill's brittle. All right? So my point is, I'm thinking that they were selling it back then. If they had the internet back at that point in the very beginning, they could turn that into a business because it was really good brittle. My point, my point is if you can do something on the side, and you know what we invested in our marshmallow? We've not done anything with the marshmallows at this. Our total investment was $250 for a mixer, which we want needed anyway, a big KitchenAid that kind of goes like, you know what I'm talking about, one of those better ones? All right. There's no labor in this. This was what was interesting. Here, here's my point. We don't have to go out and start major businesses, because uh, I'll tell you what, if $200 increase came into your house some, for some of you, how much difference would that make? For the, for, just say for the average Christian. Just $200 a week. How much difference would that make for that family? $800, $9,000 at the end of the year that they could take and turn that into something else. This is the thing that we need to start teaching. And here's where I believe that we, as a church, we talked about how are we going to reach out to the Hebraic people and the Christians, right? We need to reach out about their pocketbook. That's where they're hurting. If I was to, if this is what the Lord, I, I believe, inspired me to, to, to basically do, is do a conference for Christians on why do Jewish people make more money than Christians. Because when they begin to realize that, and they recognize and understand how hurt they are, they're going to want to, they, they do, they already do, they want a solution. When I did the conferences for Tom, and I've talked about this before, the response was incredible. When I told them our story, how God had blessed us by <clears throat> making changes in our lives. I didn't go into a lot of detail. They wanted to know what they were. What are these changes? I asked, how many of you are hurting financially? Every hand went up. All the ministers. There wasn't anybody in there that was not having a problem. Everybody in there, in both conferences, was about 40 or 50 people. <clears throat> and each time, everybody was saying, we're hurting. We need help. I think that's one of the ways that we can reach out to people is we begin to show them that God blesses us. And, and here's my point in this. If we're going to be a light on a hill, Jesse mentioned the scripture. We talk about this all the time. People should look at, us, look at us and go, I want to know their God. I want to know their theology. Why is God blessing them so much? You, you, you get what I'm saying? So if we can become a church like that, if we can become a church that is being blessed 
and we can say, God is making changes in our lives. You know, and some of you have already done this. And I know, and, you know, we got several people. Some of us are in their 60s, and we're, we're getting too old, you know, for, for a lot of things. I, I told the doc, we've told the doctor, I need more testosterone or something. I'm too tired. You, you cut it back too far. Because I'm 64 years old. I want more energy. I, I'm too young to, to sit down. So my, my point is, we might think ourselves as being too old to do anything. We feel that way. But the reality is, Moses was... 80 years old when he leads the people out of Egypt. He's 120 when he finally passes away. And during that whole time, he was in good health. I, I, I'll tell you what, I will applaud you, peop, you in here that have done extra things, that have invested in real estate and done things like that. And um, Wendy's making cakes, all right? She's, got it, she's doing a business on the side. This is, the, the thing is, that is the mindset all Christians should have. And some, here's the problem. When you have a job that you're working 40, 50, 60 hours a week, and you're so tired, it's really hard to do anything, right? It's really tough. And so what you have to do is you've got to figure out a way to do this so that you can increase it. The happiest, one of the happiest days in my life was the day that Linda quit work. You have no idea. I, I could have cried that day because she had worked so hard for all those years. She had been the backbone of our house sometimes when I'm doing a business, not knowing how to do it, and it wasn't doing real well. And so we were paying our bills with her paycheck. And the day that she was able to <clears throat> to me, and some of you have watched what's gone on for 38 years, you know, and, and there's been conversations, you know, he messed up, he's failed again, that type of thing. And I knew, and I've heard those types of things. So the day that we were able to be successful and I knew it was God and God was showing me things, it was one of the best days of my life. I mean, Lynn will tell you, we got up, just, there was a joy like we've never felt before. And I felt it's important to men to be successful. Every one of you guys know what I'm talking about. And we really don't want to have our wives working. I mean, every one of us probably has that concept. Not that it's not, the, the fact is, on the other hand, you have Lydia, who was a businesswoman. She would go to Thuatra and buy, buy cloth that was specialty cloth, purple, blue, red, it was, nobody else had it. Then she went around the country selling that. that was, she was an entrepreneur. She wasn't an employee. You got Proverbs 31. You got the woman that goes out and buys, a pro buys property. I mean, she's a businesswoman. There's nothing in wrong, wrong in that. What I didn't like is her coming home after eight hours of working for somebody else and being just drained and tired. And you guys know what I'm talking about. I just think we can, there is a solution. There can be a way that we can change our lives financially. Um, it doesn't happen overnight, but if you're, wanting, if you're in that situation where you want your wife not to work, then I think there's a way to do that. And so I'm just throwing this out there tonight, and uh, I would appreciate some feedback. Am I on this? Is, is this right? Am I, is, is this something we need to be thinking about? Or have I lost my mind? It, it, it's been, it's, it, that's been as, yeah, I... I <laughs>